Cheers. Hi, oh, cool. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so before we start, I got a lead with like a bit of a warning. Um, I'm going to be talking about like game design and game mechanics um, and like a competitive online professional tournament gaming. Um, but I'm not like a professional online tournament gamer um, or a professional game designer or anything like that. Um, I write software. Um, like I have done some game design and like some gaming tournaments and stuff, but again, it's always as like a kind of obsessive amateur level, right? Like kind of everyone else at EMS. Um, and like, so I try my best here to like gather as much like genuine scientific research as I can. Um, but a fair chunk of this is like kind of my reasoned conjecture as someone who's played a lot of games. Um, all right, so first like, I've kind of got a point out that not troll all trolling is necessarily bad. Um, so like, by definition, all trolling does like wind someone up. Um, but like, it's hopefully kind of, it can be constructive or like funny or at least like memorable. Um, and so like, so you get the picture, I've kind of broadly dropped these into two, um, two categories, the first of which like I really don't have a problem with. Um, and so this is an example of something in the first category, right? So this was, um, this was a boss in World of Warcraft. Um, he used to like hang out in the world um, and big, big organized groups of like 40 people um, would try to like team up and kill him. Um, but one like one group of guys, instead of killing him, they figured out that by like exploiting this really complicated sequence of like attack and run away and feign death and attack and die and like do some fancy ability. Um, and then they could like force this big demon dude um, to chase them like more or less indefinitely. Um, so yeah, like gamers being gamers and being trolls, um, they walked him halfway across the world and dumped him in the other faction's capital city, um, where he just like murdered literally everyone. Um, all, all those corpses are like player corpses, they're not, you know, sprites or anything like that. Um, and if you search online, you'll find like loads and loads of examples of these, they're great. Um, in, uh, in, I think it was Ultima Online, um, you'd find like, teams of people who'd walk around and like they'd find someone who'd gone to answer the door or like make a cup of tea and they're AFK. Um, and while these people were AFK, they'd quickly build eight chairs, one for each tile around the person. Um, Cause you can't move through chairs. Um, and these people were then just stuck there like until they got a mod to like bump from a few texts to the right or, um, or like switch server or something. Um, and so like these are obviously kind of trolling or griefing but I think they're also pretty good. Um, like they're clever, they're memorable, they're funny. Um, and they force developers to like think more carefully about the games they're making. Um, because then they know that if something can be exploited, then like it obviously will. Um, but then there's this dude. Um, and this dude, like I really do have a problem with. Um, and like, Having been kind of growing up around and having been exposed to the internet for a long time, like I think probably everyone here has seen examples of this guy. Um, but in case you haven't, um, in a kind of horrifying Blue Peter fashion, um, I've, I've got a bunch for you. Um, these are real chat logs taken from uh, League of Legends' this, like online tribunal system, which is like a community court. Um, and I've got to put a warning because the first one of these at least is really, really not kid friendly. Um, it's, it's totally rude. Um, so like easy, if you're easily offended or you're young, just like shut your eyes for the next couple of slides. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, so as I was saying, like there's people who are just like straight up offensive. <laughs> right, we've got the kind of bigoted, like homophobic, sexist, racist douche. And then, like, the one I, I particularly hate, um, they're kind of really, really awful human beings. And we've got the guys who are like, oh, like, uninstall the game and then kill yourself. <laughs> okay, so, like, to us kind of people who are used to this, um, and, like, once they're out of the context of the game, um, like, I find those kind of funny. Like, there's a whole website devoted to these things. Um, and, like, the problem is, with there's, there's people, a lot of people, who, like, 
haven't grown up around the internet, haven't grown up playing games, like don't have the ridiculously thick skin that a lot of gamers have. Um, and those people are like genuinely put off by this. Like just one instance of this, let alone like a 45 minute game of people just like targeting them specifically and just not letting up. Um, and that's, that's not cool. Um, like even, even the people who do have a thick skin, like I don't know anyone who doesn't get tilted um, by someone just like flaming them. So at the very, very least, all you're doing is just like putting off someone in your team um, and then making them perform worse. So like a fairly common refrain other than like, oh, grow a thicker skin um, is, well, like, why don't you mute them? Like there's muting features in the game. Um, but when you're playing in like a competitive level, you really can't mute someone. Um, because if like some dude's creeping up behind you and he's going to shoot you, and you muted the guy who saw him and is telling you where he is, then you're going to get shot in the back of the head. Um, you're probably going to lose a round. And then like the dude who you muted because he was flaming you is going to flame you even more. Um, so, so yeah, that's a bit rubbish, really. Um, I'm really like, I just want to walk towards a culture and a culture in gaming where everyone who wants to play and wants to compete is like made to feel welcomed. Um, but yeah, there's still like, there still really isn't the case. Like, People are quite homophobic and they're really, really, really sexist um, and like misogynistic. Um, I don't know any women who play like online computer games who use their microphone like ever unless they're just playing with me or my friends. Um, and like that's, that's, that's not cool. Like people should be able to compete and play at the same level as everyone else. Um, and so I think this is also particularly important because like games and online games particularly are a relatively new thing. And they're kind of these like semi anonymous spaces where like you can play and compete and talk and like hang out with your friends. Um, but this never has to be tied back to your like actual real world identity. Um, and I think for some people, like particularly people who perhaps like don't engage with traditional forms of competition, like sport, um, maybe because like they're not able bodied or they're really socially anxious, um, then like that's really, really helpful for them. Um, and like the more we can do to, to enable that, the better really. Okay, so that was the motivation for like, if you're an empathetic human being, um, but what if you're like a cold-hearted game studio, like driven by money, right? What, what if you're Ubisoft? Um, so there's a bunch of guys at Group Lens, um, which is this like really cool research institute at the University of Minnesota. Um, they scored loads of League of Legends players on, with respect to like how toxic they are. Um, and then they found that people who are new to League of Legends, who are like playing it for the first few times, or like they hadn't got to level 30, whatever that means, I don't play League of Legends. Um, they, uh, if, if they played with people who were toxic, then they were far, far more likely to either stop playing the game entirely or to take an extended break. Um, and so like that's, that's quite a result, right? That's saying that people who don't play games, or at least don't play League of Legends, are significantly put off playing more League of Legends if people are douches. Um, and, and yeah, like this, this effect kind of tails off as people get more, as people play more, sorry. Um, and so like the point of this kind of is that if your community is not garbage, um, then you're going to have more players. And if you have more players, you're going to have a stronger player base. If you have a stronger player base, you're going to continue to sell your game. So like you are financially invested in building a good community. Um, oh, what? Okay, so that was like the kind of old model of video gaming, um, but like the free to play thing is really big now. Um, and so like people apply the same arguments because free to play, like retention is even, even more important than it is when you're not free to play, right? Because when you're not free to play, you've made a whole load of money by selling the game in the first place. Um, but if you are free to play, then you've got to keep people for longer um, because the longer you keep someone, the more hats you can sell them. Um, so really, like whichever way you put it, you are invested in building a good community for your game. Um, and so the League of Legends guys, as I said, like they're, they're in the heart business. Um, and so they, uh, they, dev they like devoted a whole team um, to doing actual science, TM, um, because it's really big money to them. If they can keep their players playing longer, then they're gonna make more money. Um, so like one, one of the first things that this, this team did was they um, assigned, uh, so they, they've got loads of game data, right? There's millions of League of Legends played, games played every day. Um, so they assigned a toxicity index to every player by uh, manually classifying thousands of chat logs. Um, and 
as like people who play games and all these guys played loads of games, um, you might expect that uh, there's going to be like some really well, some fairly small minority of like really really toxic people, and they're consistently toxic. Um, and then that like everyone else who plays um, was either kind of neutral or positive, right? But mostly neutral. Most people think oh, I'm nice. Um, but actually, it turns out that's, uh, that's totally not true. Um, there is a small community or a small minority of toxic people, um, but actually it's a really, really small minority. Um, and so this, this minority is also like more aggressively toxic as well as more frequently toxic. Um, and, but it turns out that m like the vast majority of toxic behavior in toxic games turns from like normal people um, who just had a bad day. Like, they've had an argument with their girlfriend or boyfriend or like they've been shouted at by their boss at work and they get home and they're really frustrated um, and then they start playing the game and then like the mechanics of the game interact in such a way that it winds them up even more and then something happens like they die or their teammate dies um, and then they go totally nuts um, and to the other people in the game who don't know this person they just think oh that's that normal like half a percent of really toxic people there's nothing I can do about it but to the perspective of the guy who's raging He's not normally like this. This is just a bad day. And so this kind of brings us to this weird kind of place where like, we know that the vast majority of toxic behavior is just normal individuals. But we also know that all gaming communities are not equal, right? Some are more toxic, some are less toxic, like some are really nice. Um, and so we kind of like want to investigate why that happens. Um, and here, I be interested to see how much people agree with us, um, but I've ranked from uh, left to right like how miserable these games are to play with regards to like their communities. Um, if anyone's played Heroes of New Earth, um, yeah, you know. Um, I'm I'm sorry for everything that game like puts upon people. Um, so yeah, so so like why this this is kind of interesting, right? Why does this happen? Well. The first thing people think is like, oh, maybe there's selection bias. So like, people who are horrible people gravitate towards horrible games with horrible people because they can all just hang out and be horrible together. Um, but that's like that sounds accurate, and I think it probably is accurate to like some extent. Um, but it's certainly not the whole picture because like, loads and loads and loads of people play like Dota, and loads and loads and loads of people play Rocket League, and Rocket League has a fairly good community, and Dota has a really toxic community. But a lot of the people who play Dota also play Rocket League. So like, how does it work? How does one game like, make them more angry than the other game? Um, and so it, like, it, it kind of turns out that what actually happens is when you have frustrated players who have had something go wrong at your work or whatever, um, and then you put them in an inherently frustrating game, then it just goes really bad. And if you can make your game less inherently frustrating, then everything's going to be awesome, hopefully. Um, so I, I wondered why this was, and I wondered why Dota was a lot worse than, say, Rocket League. Um, so I want to do like a sort of mechanical analysis of Dota and why this game is more frustrating. And like Dota likes a kind of a whole range of games. Um, Heroes of New Earth, which was the most horrible game I put on there, is basically Dota, but like with added tools to wind people up if you don't like them. Um, which yeah, it's, it's insane. Um, and so you find, well, I, I think at least. Um, but this results from a kind of like trifecta of really grim mechanics. So first off, you've got like a really, really huge snowball, and like I'll explain what these mean in more detail in a minute. And you've got a really, really huge snowball effect. Um, you've got really like unintuitive mechanics that don't make sense unless you know a lot about Dota. Um, and then you've got a, like a huge, really massive, insane knowledge burden before you can even start playing at any reasonable level. Um, so this is a snowball. Um, like almost all games have a form of snowball mechanics, um, and what a snowball mechanic means is that like when you're ahead, it's easier to get more ahead. It's the opposite of a catch-up mechanic. Um, and they, like different games do this in different ways. Like in Counter Strike, there's the economy system. Um, in Dota, you get money when you kill people and you lose gold when you die. Um, but the implementation of Dota's like snowball mechanics specifically means that if one guy is really sucking, um, then it's better for you as a team to play 4v5 than it is to keep playing with him. Because by his sucking, he will be like actively feeding gold to the other team and making them loads better. 
Um, whereas in Counter-Strike, if one guy is really sucking, like, he's probably not going to be actively griefing you. Like, he's not going to be shooting you. He's just not going to be doing any work. So it's going to be better to play, 4v to play 5v5 on the off chance that he kills someone. Um, whereas in Dota, it's really not. Like, if, if a guy's really bad, the team will just get, the other team will just get way, way better. Um, and so this means that flaming someone until they leave is your best chance of winning. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Snowball. Um, now, I don't know how many people know what this picture is. Um, those of you who do will probably think, oh, that makes sense. Um, those of you that don't will be like, what? So originally, Dota was a Warcraft 3 mod um, running on the Warcraft 3 engine. And like Warcraft 3 is an RTS. It really wasn't designed for like competitive 10 player tower defense with hundreds of different characters. Um, so lots of like really kind of weird side effects of the engine become baked in as mechanics because you can't get rid of them if you don't have control over the engine, which is what the Dota guys had. Um, but over time, people become attached to these mechanics and they think they're good mechanics because they've grown up with them and they're used to them and they make them win over people who don't know about them. Um, so with that in mind, this, is, uh, this mechanic is called denying, right? Um, and this is, this is when you kill one of your own guys. Um, and in Dota, you want to kill your own guys as much as you possibly can. Um, if you don't kill your own guys and the other team does kill their own guys, then because of the snowball mechanic, you're going to lose horribly. What? Um, you're going to get really, really behind. And of course, like the tutorial doesn't tell you this because it's insane. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that's denying. Like I, I was going to go into the specifics of why it happens, but probably no one cares. Um, so we've got the knowledge burden next, right? So this is a screenshot of the Dota 2 hero selection screen. Um, there's 111 different heroes, which each have at least four abilities. So that's roughly 444 different abilities in the game. Um, they're multi-dimensional. So an ability might be like, oh, it does some damage and like applies a slow for three seconds. Um, if you want to play Dota in any way competitively, like not even professional level, just like low level tournaments um, or even like mid to high level matchmaking, um, it's just kind of going to be assumed that you know every single one of these, what all of them do. If you don't know what all of the abilities do, then like you're going to get flamed because you're going to get killed by something that you don't understand and the snowball mechanic means that you're going to get really, really far behind. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. So just in case that wasn't enough, there's also 148 different items. Um, they all do different things. Some of them do different things on different characters or different things with different abilities on different characters, which means that there's like actually just thousands and like tens of thousands of insane edge cases, um, like interactions between different heroes and different items. Um, so sooner or later, you're going to get killed by out of like nowhere by an interaction that makes literally no sense. Um, like you're going to die. You're going to have no idea why, and it's going to be because oh, this hero had this item, and I didn't realize that with this item it did this thing. Um, so you're going to be like this, and then the dude on your team who's now really far behind because of a snowball mechanic is going to be like this. Okay, so I've just like kind of torn into Dota for the last ten minutes. Um, but actually, I kind of like Dota some of the time. Um, and like, so you might be thinking, okay, so this, this game sounds really bad. It sounds insane. There's so much stuff that we need to know, and the people are always really angry. Um, but actually, like, people still play this game despite all of the ridiculous stuff I've just mentioned, because at the same time, like, the stuff, it's really, really miserable and makes no sense to lose to. It feels awesome when you master it. Um, like, if you know this, insanely convoluted data point that means that like your ability will actually damage this guy whereas normally it wouldn't um and then you kill him and you win the game because of that like you're going to feel like a god um so if you graph people's like frustration and enjoyment of dota games over time and then you find that it's really really spiky like you get these peaks where people love dota because they're winning and they're winning because they know all of these insane awesome things and they're playing really well um but when they're losing they're losing because they're losing to really insane things that they don't know about and it sucks and they've just got to like learn more and play more and it's really frustrating. Um, and so this really spiky graph creates this kind of attitude where people 
in Dota really, really, really hate losing. Like, losing is kind of a meme unto itself of how like unfun it is. Um, and when people really, really hate losing, they're going to get more toxic about it because when they think they're losing and they think they're tied into like a 40 minute game, but they're inevitably going to lose. Like, no one likes that. Uh, okay, so um, we're <laughs> all hypothetically game designers, right? What can we do about it? Um, well, think about your design decisions really, really carefully. Um, so, like, do you allow forfeiting? Well, if you allow forfeiting in a game like Dota, then it means it's potentially going to reduce its toxicity because the people who are getting really mad about being locked into, like, a 40-plus minute game, um, if everyone on the team agrees that, oh, this game is lost, we can just forfeit, then they're going to be less mad because they know they can always just bail out of it if they have to. Um, but at the same time, like, that's going to potentially reduce the competitive, like, skill threshold of your game because if people are just like ducking out of all of the games that they think they're losing then they're never going to like work out how to come back effectively um so you, in all of these you've got trade-offs like do you do you allow players to kick people on their other team well this can stop griefing if someone's like team killing or like actively harming your team or it's just being really really toxic like maybe you do just want to get rid of them um, and that's great but far more often than that case is the case where like someone gives up first blood or someone dies in a stupid way um, and some toxic guy on the team is immediately like, kick him because he made one mistake and now we're really, really far behind. Um, so yeah, again, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, do you allow cross-team chat? Like, can one team talk to the other team? Um, it can reduce toxicity because other like people like to flame each other when they're winning and when the other team is sucking. Um, but this like increased toxicity um if you do disable cross team chat to get rid of it then your community is going to take a hit because if you've got a good community where people like like to play games and like to talk to each other and stuff um then they're not going to have that positive interaction that they would otherwise so this is kind of if you've already got a bad community then you might want to do this to make it less bad um but if you've got a good community then hopefully you don't need it um yeah and finally like what about voice chat so most games do have voice chat enabled. Like, there's a notable couple that don't. Um, again, interestingly, like, enabling voice chat can reduce toxicity because when you hear someone talking over the mic, when you're like, oh, that's a natural person, now I have some empathy. They're not just like a faceless avatar behind a mystery keyboard somewhere. Um, but also, like, it's, it's harder to moderate verbal abuse reports if that's the thing that you do. Um, and also, it does open up, like, more griefing opportunities. Like, in Counter Strike, the dude that just plays music down his microphone for the whole game. Um, again, like there's, there's no easy answer to this, and you, you just have to think about them carefully and how they fit into your picture like of your game as a whole. Um, okay, so coming back to League of Legends, and the, again, this is data from the dudes that did that study. It's a really, really awesome study. Like, If you're interested in this, go and, go and watch the video. Um, this is the only one for which I actually have any data or evidence. <laughs> um, but... So the, these guys tried a bunch of really interesting things um, to see if they could like reduce or or improve their community, um, and uh, so the first one that they did was um, with uh, they they set cross team chat, so being able to talk to the other team or not um, as a uh, as a like an opt in, um, and that like drastically reduced um, toxicity across a whole load of character uh, categories because now like the only people that wanted to, or like, were interested in talking to each other, were the people who'd explicitly said, yeah, let's talk to the other team. Um, there wasn't, like, an overall decrease, or I think it's, like, 2% or something, I can't see from here, but there wasn't a drastic overall decrease in total chat, it was just the chat that was there was a lot better. Um, and then the other thing they did was they added, uh, like, sort of gameplay hints to the loading screen and things like that. Um, and again, like, these, uh, these improved the, like, the quality of the game significantly. Okay, um, again, now these next two are kind of my conjecture about why I think these are good things. Um, so in Rocket League, um, those of you who don't know, Rocket League is like a really kind of frantic game that's played with a controller. Um, and in it, the devs implemented this quick chat system. Um, and loads of games have done quick chat systems, like, but they're all, or they're mostly informational. Um, and Cyanox did things a bit differently, so they, uh, they made over half of them either apologies or compliments. Um, and that, that does two really awesome things. Um, so the first is that like 
because people are generally quite lazy um, and because the game mechanics aren't inherently as frustrating, they're less frustrated by the game. And so it's much easier for them when someone makes up, when someone messes up to be like, oh, no problem, on their quick chat, um, than it is to like pull out their keyboard and start flaming someone. Um, and the second thing it does that's really awesome is that um, it lets people like sarcastically troll each other um, in the way that like you probably would when you're playing with one of your friends. Let's like, say so, like, if you totally miss, then you're going to be like, oh, nice shot. Um, and this only becomes really obnoxious like when people start spamming it. Because before people start spamming it, it's just kind of assumed, oh, like, you know, they're just having a laugh. Um, but yeah, so it's only obnoxious when they're spam, and there's spam blockers in Rocket League. So if you say quick chat more than, like, four times in, I don't know, 10 seconds or something, then you're not allowed to say anything again for, like, the next minute. Um, and, like, by and large, the Rocket League community is really good, um, and I think this is a significant part of the reason why. And it, it seems small, but, like, if you play the game and you experience this, you'll be like, oh, this is actually really, this is really friendly. Everyone's just like chatting to each other through this system. Um, and so next I want to talk about Overwatch, um, which uh, it, it came out really recently. Um, and as part of their build up to releasing the game, um, the devs made a whole bunch of like really interesting videos talking about uh, like all the work they put into reducing toxicity and uh, improving like the game feel for different people. Um, and so the main thing that they did, um, because this is a class-based game, um, is that like even though like Dota and League of Legends and I know Team Fortress say are all class-based games, um, they're really lazy with their scoring systems. So like you hit tab and you see the scores of everyone in the game, um, and the scores that you see are just like, oh, this guy has killed six people and they've died twelve times. Like okay, if you're playing a role where your role is to kill loads of people, then yeah, that means you're probably not doing too well. Um, but if you're playing a support role, like you're a healer or, uh, I don't know, like a guy who gives shields to people or something, um, then, uh, then like that stat is kind of meaningless. Um, but it gives people an excuse to flame you because they look at the stats and they're like, oh, we're losing. This guy has died two times as more times as he has killed someone. Let's flame him for the next 10 minutes because he sucks. Um, so what, what Overwatch did was they... Um, they worked out metrics that are actually helpful and like actually represent how well you're playing your role, um, and then they highlighted them. So during the game, if you're playing really well according to your role, um, then it'll be like, oh, you're on fire, you're doing really well, and like everyone on your team and the other team can see that. Um, and that has no actual like mechanical impact on the game. It doesn't make you faster, it doesn't make you stronger, it doesn't do anything. It just shows to everyone else that you're playing really well. Um, and again, like it's kind of positive feedback hit for you. You're like, yeah, this is awesome. Um, and uh, and the other thing they did was post game, um, they display these four like little scorecards of four people who they think played particularly well or played their roles particularly well. Um, and you can commend them. And like, if you commend people, then you're more likely to play more games with them in the future. And the more commends you get, like the nicer you are rated as a person. Um, and again, like these are really small things, but. The Overwatch community is also really, really good. So, like, they must be doing something right. Um, it's difficult to say, like, how much of an interaction it is between the game mechanics and how much it is, like, kind of UI stuff like this or UX stuff like this. Um, obviously, it's an interplay between the two, but it's, like, and I'm just highlighting them anyway. Okay, so um, that was kind of really whistle stop tour. Um, I wanted to talk about, like, well, building a good community is important, both financially and for the community as large. Um, I, I did want to talk about games, Heroes of New Earth, that purposefully foster a really grim community. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't really have time. Um, so if you are interested in talking about that, then like I'm going to be outside um, after the next talk, because I want to watch the next talk. Um, so just like find me then, and, uh, and we can talk about it, and it'll be awesome. Uh, thanks. These are my references. If you're interested in them, I can give them to you. Um, the slides will be on Twitter or something. I don't know if we've got time for questions. Uh, got some, got some. Awesome. Go for it. Oh, yeah, we've got questions. Here we go. Um, I haven't played many games, but the couple of games I've been involved in, like Glitch, the reason why the community was so strong was because the developers were an active part of the forum. So relationships got formed. 
And it was interesting how that pretty quickly stamped on any behavior, but became a collaborative endeavor. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, so um, I think the point there was that um, there's, there's a game, I'm afraid I didn't catch the name of it, um, that has a really, really strong community um, resulting from the developers like playing a big hand in like kind of nurturing that community and like hanging out on Reddit and the forums and things like that. Um, and yeah, like that's, I think that's a really important thing as well. Like the game I mentioned earlier, um, Rocket League, the, even though that's a massively popular game, um, the developers for that are known to hang out on like the Rocket League Reddit and they talk to people and they take community suggestions. Um, and yeah, that's like, that's a really positive thing, um, both for like fostering the, uh, or like supporting the, um, the studio as well as kind of pushing that back to the player base. Yeah, thanks. Um, is, is there a possibility that in games it's not just the gameplay but also the kind of feel of the game that is kind of affecting the community as well because like in things like Overwatch and stuff it's all very stylized and like you, you, you see loads of like pictures on the internet even if you're not looking for Overwatch you, you'll come across people playing it and drawing about it and talking about it and things like uh, Splatoon for the Nintendo uh, Wii U got did quite well and seemed to have a good community because it was encouraging people to draw things. So do you think that's another route to improve this? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the question was like, do, do I think that um, games that have, I guess, interesting or like kind of more stylized aesthetics um, and like the look and feel of a game rather than the mechanical gameplay, um, does that in and of itself like also foster a good community? Um, and, and why? And yeah, I think that's like that certainly could well be true. Um, like Call of like Call of Duty and Halo Xbox Kids are a meme for a reason, right? Um, so yeah, certainly I think like if you can take people out of like this grim, gritty reality that they live in, um, then yeah, that probably like does make them feel more inclined to be nice than each other because the real world sucks. Um, and yeah, yeah, everything should be bright and colorful. That would be sweet. Um, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I, I can't quite hear you. Sorry, does this work? Uh, I grew up on subscription-based games and um, found that the abuse in those was, was a lot less. And it was almost as if players had a vested interest to behave. And certainly I noticed when Dota came in in the free-to-play model that there was almost this, um, you know, there wasn't any concern from a player because you could go in, cause absolute mayhem, and if you got banned, you could just go and create another account. Do you find that, that there is a more sort of toxicity for free-to-play games versus um, subscription-based? Yeah, um, so the question was, do we find that there's more toxicity in um, free-to-play games because there's no barrier, obviously no monetary barrier to entry um, than there is in like subscription games? Um, and yeah, like, I, I hadn't actually thought of that. Um, that's that's probably a fairly, yeah, probably interesting point. Um, I think that like yes is kind of my short answer, um, but because you see this is reflected in the real world as well, like outside of just games, um, so like forums that anyone can hang out and talk on that you, you, know, you don't have to know people to get in or you don't have to pay money to get in or whatever. Um, they just get more toxic, like um, YouTube comments. Woo. Um, yeah, anywhere like where there's no kind of strong sense of community, um, I think is likely to be more toxic. And yeah, I think adding a barrier to entry does mean that you're more likely to have a strong sense of community because by definition there'll probably be less people involved in it. Um, whether or not the act of like actually handing money over to someone um, gets you more invested in making something nice for you and the people around you, um, I couldn't say. I think it's probably true, um, but, but yeah, I, I don't know. Thanks. Okay. I'm, I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions right now, but the next session is also on computer games, so if you're into computer games, hang around for Catherine's session. Um, so, yeah, last thing to say, thank you very much for talking to us. Cool. So, thank you. Thank you.